taking up H962 this morning, which has to do with uh, the duration of temporary relief from abuse orders. Uh, the committee is is pretty well um, set on the on the goals of the bill and and how it worked. There is one provision, however, that has uh, certain committee members concerned, and um, so we have um, an amendment. And it's not a. And I, unfortunately, I when when I did the agenda, I I forgot an important person. And he is here, Eric Fitzpatrick. Could you just briefly go over the amendment and then we'll hear from Sarah Robinson, John Campbell, uh, Brian Grierson and Matt Valerio. Yeah, sure, we'll do. Morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to talk about, as Senator Sears said, uh, looking at uh, H962 again. This is an act relating to the duration of temporary relief from abuse orders. Everybody probably remembers that this is uh, an attempt to get at a, a gap that's created current under current law because these temporary relief from abuse orders are generally in effect for only 14 days and they need to be personally served on the defendant before they can become effective. So the temporary order is in effect for 14 days, then you have uh, a final hearing within that 14 day period. And uh, if the defendant turns up at the final hearing, that's no problem. The statute provides that if the defendant is there personally, then they are deemed to have been served by the, or the final order. And therefore the temporary order is in effect until that final hearing and the final order becomes in effect right then when the court issues it, if the defendant is physically present. The issue comes up when the defendant is not physically present at that final hearing, uh, because then the temporary order typically expires after the 14 day period and it takes a few days for them to find the defendant and sometimes longer to serve him or her. So you have, that creates the gap. That's a period of time after the temporary order has expired after the 14 day maximum uh, and before the final order has been served, you have a little window uh, when, when there is no order in effect. And that's the uh, issue that H962, as it came over from the house, attempted to resolve. And the way it did that was it said, okay, if you think about, the timeline of, of the temporary order being issued. You've got 14 days within which the court has to hold the hearing. Uh, during that 14 day period, there's really say three different, three different um, options for what could happen to that temporary order that's in effect. First of all, during that 14 day period, say the court could conceivably just dismiss it. That happens once in a while, that could happen. Uh, for maybe the parties agree, maybe uh, there's some other facts that present themselves. The court could conceivably dismiss it during that period. Um, but if not, then the final, the final hearing comes up and, then, and at that final hearing, there's two options for the court, right? The court can either grant the petition and issue a final order or deny the petition. So those are your three, your three possible, uh, possible results after a temporary order has been issued. So what the legislation proposed to do is to say, okay, we're going to make it clear, the language will make it clear that that temporary order will remain in effect uh, until one of those three things happens, till either the court dismisses the temporary order, till the court denies the petition at the final hearing, or uh, if the court does issue the final order at that final hearing, then the temporary order remains in effect until the final one is served. And that closes the gap, you see, because the, the temporary order um, although it would ordinarily expire after 14 days, uh, I'm proposing the language in the bill that says, well, if the court issues a final order at that final hearing, then, then the temporary order remains in effect until it's served. That way you don't have that gap anymore because that temporary uh, order remains effective until the, the defendant is located and served with the final order. So that's the gist of what's going on. That's what was, was in the, the House bill. And as you mentioned, Senator Sears, there's some, some uh, amended, amendments that are proposed in this version of the bill, they're highlighted in yellow on the document that's posted. Uh, the first one, we went over this one last time, you'll see has simply to do with notice. And this is uh, in section one, page one, lines 12 through 15. And this just is a, a mechanism to provide the defendant with notice that uh, if they don't appear at that final hearing, as I just explained, if they don't show up, then the temporary order is gonna remain in effect uh, until it's served on the defendant. Uh, unless it's dismissed by the court. So that's a notice piece. Eric, can I ask you a question? Please. Line 14, 
the word it. I know what you're trying to do, but in reading that in plain English, what are you referring to? Uh, the temporary order. Okay. No. I don't think you are. I think you're referring no. to the final order. So I, I think you're right. Be clear about oh, I'm that. sorry. You're right. I've just proved your point. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so yes, exactly. So uh, uh, that should be. Uh, I, I think what you wanted to say was uh, will remain in effect until a final order is served on the defendant, unless the temporary order is dismissed by the court. Yes. Nice catch. Thank you, Senator Benning. I was waiting for my colleague, Senator Baruth, to catch it first because he's <laughs> the English major. <laughs> There's another uh, issue here with this language that uh, uh, Sarah from the uh, caught as well, uh, but I'm going to come back to it because we're going to get to when we look at the other uh, subsequent language will become clear. But there's another tweak that might the committee might want to make depending on what your decision is uh, with respect to the maximum period that we discussed last time. But I've got those changes uh, that you just mentioned, Senator Benning. Thank you. Uh, so that's the notice piece. So then we move on to uh, bottom of section two, top of, or sorry, bottom of page two, top of page three. And this, there's, you see the language that's not highlighted is what I, I discussed earlier, that the temporary order remains in effect until it's either dismissed by the court uh, or denied at the final hearing. And then I'm gonna skip that middle sentence. The last sentence also unchanged is if the final order is issued temporary order remains in effect until uh, personal service of the final order. That's the piece that closes the potential gap. Another issue that came up uh, initially in the house and that this uh, committee has been discussing as well is leaving the defendant aside for a moment. What about when the plaintiff potentially might not show up at that final hearing? And that does happen occasionally as well. And you can see that that's what's addressed in that middle sentence in 2A. So, if the plaintiff fails to appear at the final hearing, the petition shall be dismissed, uh, provided that the court may continue the temporary order until the final hearing, if it makes uh, findings on the record stating why there's good cause not to dismiss the petition. So that's the uh, language that attempts to address the situation where the plaintiff might not turn up at that final hearing. And the idea is that generally speaking, the, the default is that if the plaintiff doesn't turn up, the order gets to, the petition gets dismissed but there is some leeway language there uh, for sort of uh, you know, exceptional circumstances where the court can, can continue that temporary order as long as it makes these findings on the record that there's good cause not to dismiss it. So you, can you see the highlighted language that was tweaked a little bit just to uh, um, make clear that, that uh, the court was not gonna be able to um, continue the temporary order indefinitely. And that's the same issue that's addressed in that last highlighted piece because the, the committee was then discussing last time, well, should there be a maximum period? Should there be a, uh, you know, rather than a temporary order potentially being in effect indefinitely, should there be some length of time beyond which the temporary would expire? Again, that would obviously mean that for that period of time, the defendant couldn't be located and served, right? If for some long, for some, um, length of time that the defendant couldn't be served would the temporary expire essentially and the committee hadn't settled on a length of time but you did uh, want some language in there to address that concept and that's what you see that's newly highlighted line six to eight page three this says okay notwithstanding anything else that you just said about um, how long the temporary remains in effect in no event is it going to be longer than X number of months. And I put in both three and six just as, and even that's not, it doesn't have to be three or six. It could be any period that the committee chooses uh, or no period at all. Uh, but at least the language is there for you to discuss the idea of whether or not um, you need to have a maximum length of time that applies to the, the temporary order. And uh, just one, one last point uh, that I'll make that I mentioned just a moment ago that Sarah Robinson caught. So thanks for catching that, Sarah. If you, if you look at back at the language regarding notice, uh, this is on page one, lines 12 through 15. If you do decide to 
have the temporary effective for some maximum period of time, just for the sake of discussion, let's say six months. And you probably want to amend this notice language as well, because the way it reads now is that uh, the temporary order remains in effect uh, until uh, it is served on the defendant. Um, sorry, unless the final order is served on the defendant, unless the temporary order is dismissed by the court. So you probably want to include some reference in there, uh, you know, that it's not going to, uh, it has, you know, won't remain in effect for a maximum period of six months and then go on to say the rest of the language. Something that, because as written right now, if you do choose a maximum period, it wouldn't technically be accurate. So you want to include some reference to the maximum period if you decide to, to go that route. Does that make sense, everybody? You're just meaning referencing the last paragraph as opposed to putting in language here that would mirror that. Uh, I think, yeah, just probably a few words that um, something like, uh, uh, you know, some, let's say six months, then it could be just something that said, you know, shall until the temporary will remain in effect for a period of six months or until it is, or until the final order is served on the defendant. Well, you, you're going to want to be careful because you're not going to want to give a judge carte blanche to say, we'll extend the temporary order out five months and then come back for the final hearing. I, I would only suggest that we reference the uh, last paragraph. In other words, saying something like uh, subject to, to be below and then go on with the rest of it that it'll remain in effect until either a final order is served or dismissed by the court. I just, I don't want to leave any confusion where a judge feels like they have authority to continue a temporary order in place for a given period of time. Right now, I think the attempt is made to get a final hearing within 14 days. Right. <laughs> so just maybe cross-reference the provision, right? Yeah, that could work. All right. Any further comments or questions for Eric? If not, we'll go to Sarah first, please. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, good to see you all. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the committee taking this back up. Uh, I'm happy to speak to these proposed changes and believe um, Judge Gerson will also be able to provide information about how these cases are already handled for the court in these circumstances. So the first proposed change that Eric outlined on page one, providing notice to the defendant about the temporary order remaining in effect if they fail to appear, we're fine with this language. I did want to just note for the committee that the court already provides notice to the defendant when they are served with a temporary order. Um, so it's on the order itself and it warns them that at the court hearing, the court may decide to quote, extend or change the order. Um, and so they, they are already warned of that possibility, but if the committee you know, believes it's necessary to let the committee know that it may happen if they fail to appear, we would certainly support that. Um, so we're fine with that language. Um, and are fine with the language around the plaintiff failing to appear. I think that really accurately reflects the intent um, and certainly our intent. So um, thank you very much for that, that suggestion, um, Senator Benning. And then I think the only place for concern for us is the second page on, uh, the second change on page three regarding time periods. Um, and I think Judge Grierson can speak to really what is already current practice, but in our view, essentially the temporary order should always be temporary. Um, and the ideal is certainly that there's, the hearing is held within 14 days. The temporary is not much longer than those 14 days. Um, and if that, if the defendant can't be served with a final order, that law enforcement continues to attempt service until they're successful. And you know, the, the concern I have about putting a time period on here is that you could essentially be creating two kinds of temporary orders. One that is 14 days if the defendant shows up at the hearing, and then a three or six month temporary order if the defendant doesn't show up. Um, and you know, certainly from the victim's perspective, achieving a final order rather than an extended temporary order is much preferred because the final order may be more tailored to the relief that's specific to their circumstances. 
Um, so, you know, the, the hope with the bill was really to try and address just this sh hopefully very short time period. Um, but I do have some concern about adding an additional time period. I think it's just going to be confusing um, to both the defendant and the plaintiff. And um, frankly, could also create just more court involvement um, for a plaintiff who's really trying to achieve a fixed period of safety in their lives. Um, so our preference would really be just to maintain the current court practice whereby um, the court's the one that determines the length of the final order, certainly, and that law enforcement continues to try and serve a defendant with a final order until they're successful. Um, and I would just finally note that, um, you know, this is, it's really in the defendant's hands, whether or not they appear at the final hearing. Um, so if they would like the temporary order not to be extended, um, they are certainly able to appear at the final hearing um, in order in order to try and achieve that. So that's all I had for, and I'm happy to take questions. And the question to Sarah. Yes, Joe. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I'm just gonna throw something back at you to think about. This paragraph was designed not as a target of the defendant, I'm sorry, of the, uh, yeah, the defendant. It was designed as being targeted at the plaintiff who doesn't show up for a final hearing. And the desire, at least on my part, was that we not continue ad nauseum a temporary order if the plaintiff doesn't show. There's another possibility though I hadn't thought about until you were just speaking, and that is a defendant might show up for a temporary and say, I haven't had time to get a, an attorney yet. So the judge might look at that as good cause to continue the temporary and then come back to have a hearing where the defendant might come back again and say, I haven't had an opportunity to get an attorney yet. We don't wanna see that problem continue either because then you've got a temporary order in place that would automatically expire. Yeah. But this would yeah. actually force the court to issue a final order under the defendant not showing up. But we have nothing on the other hand when a plaintiff doesn't show up to limit the time frame by which the court can keep issuing an extension of a temporary order. So I'm just asking you to think about that. That's that's why, at least in my head, this language was originally proposed. No. That that's helpful. Um, you know, my sense is that in practice, if the plaintiff doesn't show, obviously the court has to. Um, you know, in the language, uh, if they they have to make findings on the record, and there has to be good cause um, to not dismiss the petition, and you know, it, the sorts of cases that, you know, my understanding and Judge Grierson can also speak to this. This might happen are exceptional and are cases where someone might be, for example, hospitalized um, and unable to come to court, and in which case the court would reset a hearing. So there would then be another opportunity. The court would again have to make findings on the record and have good cause um, for extending again. So I, I don't um, I don't believe that under current practice or under the current law, it would mean uh, that the court has the ability to really, you know, extend these orders in perpetuity um, as long. So that that would be my take. Okay, I would, I'd like to hear some more from Judge. Pearson to figure out if we can get to a solution here somehow. Judge Pearson, you said. Yeah, there is a Judge Pearson. Sorry about that, Judge Grierson. <laughs> um, actually, the next witness is John Campbell. If we're finished with Sarah. John, any thoughts on this? Well, I'd be interested to hear uh, Judge Grierson, uh, what he has to say, but um, I, first of all, I, I actually caught the same thing that Joe, um, um, Senator Benning and Senator Bruth were catching there in that first one was, uh, so it looks like that'll be taken care of. 
Um, I, I think the biggest you know, concerns we see are, is the fact that, uh, you know, the service process on these things, um, the, what would uh, concern me is if, uh, if law enforcement, because right now that this is a priority for them, that they that this takes priority over any other summons or any other uh, process that needs to be served, and if they're um, of the you know feeling that oh well if I don't serve, new I don't, sorry, if they don't if they feel like uh, that this doesn't really uh, I don't have to really worry uh, to get it served right away because uh, it's going to be this temporary order will be extended. Sure. Am, am am I on here or because I hear. Maybe you're locked up, Senator Sears. I didn't mean no, you're I locked think, up. I think somebody is saying something. Yeah. I think Senator Sears is locked up. Oh. He shouldn't be, but maybe you come to his aid there, Joe. John, I believe we lost a portion of your testimony to a Zoom failure. Um, okay. And now we're back on. So if you would start from perhaps even the beginning. I don't know how many people lost it. Did, am I the only one that lost Zoom? There we were, actually lost you, Dick. I think we lost oh. you, Senator Sears. Oh, okay. So never mind then. Everybody else heard you. I didn't. Just remember that. The the point I was just, all right, what I was trying to point out, uh, Senator, was that uh, if um, the you know, law enforcement right now has uh, considers these as a priority for service and um, what worries me is if they go out and they try to serve at one time um, and uh, they don't get service. And if they know that this is the temporary order will re remain in place indefinitely, um, it may, you know, they may not go and try to serve that final one um, as quickly, um, or, you know, it might fall down the priority list. But because uh, oftentimes the, the other thing that has to be taken into consideration is, uh, and I think Sarah touched on this, is that the final order is, is uh, often different than the temporary order. It could be more restrictive. It could be um, uh, taking other things into consideration. They could have um, had some agreements. Um, so um, I, I think any effort right now to try to uh, put, um, to deal with these issues is, is positive. And I see what you're going through here um, is the right direction. Um, again, it's uh, the question about the, the last one, which was B, um, you know, putting the time frame on there. And I think that's a, you know, policy decision uh, that, again, I, I'd like to listen to Judge Grierson and then uh, possibly order, uh, offer uh, further testimony if that's possible. Anything's possible, John. Um, <clears throat> I, um, did you get, did you get straightened out with the house on that budget item um, for the domestic violence folks in Bennington and Wyndham counties? I have not checked uh, uh, whether that has gone through to their, if the recommendation was made. I'll, I'll, I'll so check. If we need to, we can put something in this bill. Okay. Um, if that, that's possible, because again, we, we certainly don't want to lose the prosecutor. And right, over the, the uh, that testing, and we could put that in here. Okay, just put the language, okay. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So that they don't, if we don't get the money that way there, they wouldn't lose the positions. Okay. Cause we don't have the other money, you know, to pay out uh, for the compromise. So I think this would be the best way. Okay. Well, okay. let us know um, as soon as you find out. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll have that back to you uh, as soon as I'm off. In fact, Pepper's listening in. So I'll have him check uh, with the, um, with Senator, I mean, uh, House Appropriations. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Judge Grierson. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. For the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify to H962 or the amendments to it. Um, I'll begin with the, uh, on page one, lines 12 through 15, uh, we, do not have any uh, objection to that language. It uh, really would add to what we already say. Sarah indicated, uh, um, and I can tell the committee that currently our form that is served with the temporary order includes language under a paragraph that uh, capital letters, important information for defendant. 
And it says at the hearing to be held on the date and time specified on the face of this order, this is referring to a temporary order, the court will decide on whether to extend or change the order or issue a final order. After hearing, uh, an order may be issued, which will remain in effect as long as the judge decides uh, the relief is necessary. And an order may be issued against you granting the plaintiff's request for relief as the court deems appropriate. If you fail, I'm sorry. If you fail to appear at the final Senator Nick, you're if you uh, yes. Senator Sears, we can't see you or hear you. I can I actually see him, but I can't hear him. Oh really? You can see him? Yes. Yeah, he's frozen. He's frozen. I can't see him at all. Interesting. And Philip, I can see your mouth moving, but not hear you. He's muted. Dick, maybe if you turn off your video. Nick, could you take over for a few minutes? I'm going to move since I've lost the Zoom. Yes. Okay, so Unless go ahead. You want me to continue, Senator? Yes. So our current uh, form has language that says, if you fail- I keep running out and I think it- <laughs> Fail to appear at the final hearing, an order may be issued against you granting the plaintiff's request for relief as the court deems appropriate. So this would just add language on page one, would just add another element that um, saying that the temporary order will remain in effect until the final order is served. Um, and that's the that was certainly the whole purpose of the, uh, the original bill. So we don't have any objection to that. Um, the language at the top of page three, whoops. We're listening. Have you lost me? No. I don't the last three. words are at the top of page three. Oh, okay, so at the top of page three, again, we don't have any objection to that language. We really, in, in my opinion, have the in, inherent authority to continue or not continue a hearing, so this uh, just provides some guidance in under what circumstances uh, we can continue a temporary order. So again, we have no objection to it. Um, the section B on page three uh, is what I guess really brings the, the committee back uh, this week. And I was able to listen to a portion of last week's uh, testimony and the concerns raised. I, I'm not really sure why this language is necessary. Um, for this reason, a, a temporary order uh, would issue on an ex parte basis, um, on emergency basis, and one of two things will happen. If the defendant is served with a temporary order and does not appear at the hearing, the whole purpose of this bill was to extend the life of the temporary order until the individual can be served with the final order so that there is a there's no gap that's been referred to so there would be no reason to limit the length of time on that temporary order having been served on the defendant and under the current uh, statute uh, 1103 there is no time limit on on a final order um, and until the person is served with the temporary order, I wouldn't see any reason to then time limit that order. That would be the only order that's in effect until the individual is served. The other circumstance would be a temporary order is issued, um, but the defendant has not been served. Um, if the plaintiff then appears Again, keep in mind, these are civil proceedings. If the plaintiff wants to continue uh, the temporary order until service is made, uh, generally speaking, that, that is their decision. Um, so you have a plaintiff appearing, wants to continue the order. Um, we would continue the order. Um, if you put a time limit on the temporary order that has not been served, uh, I think it, it, it if anything, it, it could incentivize uh, the defendant uh, to stay away from avoid service and defeat the whole purpose of the of the request. Um, and and 
Judge Grierson, let, uh, Senator Benning wants to weigh in along the way there. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, uh, Judge. You are reading this as if this language is targeted at the plaintiff. Uh, I'm sorry, the defendant. And I understand why you're reading it that way, but the initial intent here was, let me give you a practical example. We would both agree that if a defendant gets served with the temporary order and a final hearing is scheduled, if the defendant shows up at that hearing with an attorney, but the plaintiff does not have an attorney and requests one, I think we'd both agree that that's good cause for the temporary hearing to be continued and to enable her to get an attorney. Yeah, I, I would agree. And just the, the question, that. It's, it's a normal practice. Now, if either side requests an attorney, we will continue it for two weeks. So the, the question then becomes, what if the plaintiff comes back a second time and says, I haven't had a chance to get an attorney yet. How long does that process continue before the court decides it's no longer good cause? You know, that's what this language was intended to address. But that's, that's well, First of all, that's, I don't think that's what the language says. I think it goes way beyond that. But taking your example, Senator Benning, um, I've certainly been in situations where, um, and, I, and I think it's fairly routine, um, when someone requests an attorney, my practice, and I think a fairly common practice, is to go out two weeks for a simple reason that within the 14 days, number one, uh, but also it's hard to get an attorney on one week's notice. If that person comes back uh, in two weeks time and still doesn't have an attorney, my practice and experience, and I, I would tell the individual at that first hearing, you've got two weeks to get an attorney. Uh, we will not continue this again. And I, I cannot tell you that, that every judge would proceed that way, but we're mindful of the defendant's rights as much as we are of the plaintiff's right to pursue this. And we give anybody an opportunity to get an attorney. It doesn't make any difference if plaintiff or defendant, and we generally will go out two weeks to give them that opportunity with the expression that if you do not get one, we're going to proceed that day. Somebody would have to come in at the end of that two weeks uh, with a real strong argument, Senator Benning, as to why they weren't able to get an attorney. But uh, that already happens, and judges dismiss these um, or they move ahead with them if it's the defendant doesn't have an attorney. I mean, it, the problem with RFAs and the problem with using an example is every case is so fact specific. Um, and that, that's my concern is that if you create an artificial deadline, I think it's going to quite frankly defeat the purpose of what the original uh, legislation was. It, it's, it, it's because it's a civil proceeding, if the plaintiff has obtained that order and wants to continue to pursue it without the defendant having been served, I don't think there should be a time limit on that, that order. Um, on the other hand, um, if the order is granted and has been served, there is, that is, that is the intent of this bill to keep that temporary order alive, that would be the only order to protect the plaintiff. Um, and I understand that we have, uh, there may be some confusion around the plaintiff not appearing um, that already happens from time to time. And we address it on an individual basis. Um, obviously this is, as, as uh, John Campbell indicated, this is a policy decision on the part of the committee I, I see this in some respects um, as, a, as, a, as a problem looking for a solution. Solution looking for a problem, I guess is what I meant to say. <laughs> uh, I just don't think it's necessary. Um, okay. Thank you. Right. Let's have a question for Judge Grierson. Well, Judge Grierson, were you finished with what you wanted to say? I, I think I was, Senator, but I'm glad to answer any questions. Any, does anyone have any questions? Senator Sears, do you? 
you're muted. All right, who's next on the, um, I don't have the sheet for who's next. Yeah. On the yeah. Senator, I, I would just add this comment if I could. Um, as, as I said before, the, the court is mindful of the rights of the defendant in this process as well as the plaintiff. Uh, it has not been my experience uh, that judges continue these temporary orders for an extended period of time if the plaintiff is not participating. If, the, if we have no information from the plaintiff as to why they're not there, these matters are dismissed. Uh, there are many occasions when we end up in court with only the defendant there uh, having been served and appeared and the plaintiff does not appear, we have no information. Those are routinely dismissed as a matter of course. Um, I, would, I would think you'd almost have to be careful that if the plaintiff doesn't appear and you put in a time limit, there may be a tendency to extend the temporary order, uh, even if the plaintiff isn't there, if you then put in this time limit, say, well, the plaintiff isn't here, we don't know why, but the statute now says we can continue a temporary order for, for whatever you choose, a month. Or, and, and you may get the, the consequences of, that you don't want by adding that language. I think the court is well equipped to deal with these individual situations, be it plaintiff or defendant not appearing uh, and addressing uh, those issues. Uh, the other parts of the bill um, are consistent with the, with the original intent and I think they do serve uh, an appropriate policy choice. This one just concerns me because I think it has the possibility of creating more issues um, than, it, than it's solving. And I'm not sure it's solving uh, the issue. Not sure what the issue is you're trying to resolve. I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you, I'm back. And um, Comcast had problems yesterday, actually several of us uh, missed the end of yesterday's session. I think that's what happened here, but I moved inside just in case it's on my end. But I think it's Comcast having problems. Um, and I apologize, but I, if I hear the gist of what's being discussed, it is B on line six on page three that is problematic. Am I correct? Yes. yes. If that, so I, I'm with the gist of what you were trying to say, Judge. If you have any questions, Senator, I'll be glad to answer them. No, I, I, I don't. I think I got enough of your testimony. I'm sorry I missed parts of it, but I, I think I got enough to, and I know I was ably replaced by the Senator from Windsor um, County, but um, it, Senator Baruth has a question, I believe. Oh, Senator Baruth, you know, don't. All right, so um, why don't we, uh, are there any other questions for Judge Grierson? Judge, thank you. Uh, Matt Valeri, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Yeah, the, the only comment that uh, I wanted to make about this, it does uh, deal with that last uh, paragraph. The rest of this is, is fine as far as I'm concerned. Um, what, I, what I think needs to, uh, I th needs to be addressed to some degree is the fact that we have the potential now for temporary orders to remain in effect indefinitely based upon the reading of the rest of the bill. And because they're temporary orders, then the defendant has not presented any evidence or, you know, they may not have even notice of, uh, of what went on. Um, I wouldn't want to see a temporary order remain in effect indefinitely. And that's the, that is the concern. And there are all kinds of nuances about who shows or who doesn't for the, uh, for the final hearing, if the plaintiff doesn't show up, I mean, oftentimes, you know, my experience in the, when I was doing this for the 15 years before I was defender general, it was because the plaintiff and defendant had made some kind of reconciliation or made some agreement between themselves. Um, and uh, all of those things make for odd results uh, where the court has really does have discretion to do all kinds of things, continue, continue the order or, um, or dismiss it outright. And the vast majority of times, and Judge Grierson is absolutely correct, 
the orders are dismissed when the plaintiff doesn't show up. Um, but there are other times when they're, when they're not. Um, and I, I just thought that it would be, and I still think that it's a good idea to give some direction to say, you know, we aren't going to be sitting on temporary orders indefinitely. Um, and uh, so after some period of time and whatever that is, uh, the temporary order goes away. Um, and it, does, it perhaps creates other problems. Um, but, uh, you know, prior to this amendment of, of the statute, the temporary orders um, didn't just, uh, uh, you know, if they weren't served, they didn't just remain in effect. And so by creating that, which was the original intent of the bill, you now create this other situation where you basically have the potential for an almost indefinite temporary order. Um, and, you know, I don't think anything's totally indefinite. So, you know, that's why I say almost. And, and so to me, there should be some reasonable limit on how long a temporary order would remain in effect. Um, and you can dream up, all, dream up all kinds of scenarios, whether the whether it's the plaintiff who show up or the mm -hmm. defendant who doesn't get served and doesn't show up. Um, and you know how the court deals with it, and I was hoping to provide some direction for that um, by this paragraph. Um, and I hear what the judge is saying. You know, just leave it, basically leave it to the discretion of the court to figure it out at the time, because there are too many nuances um, to to uh, what might be going on. Um, to me, however, I. I do think that it, uh, I would not want to see a temporary order basically be hanging out there indefinitely um, without uh, being in effect without service. Okay. Um, you know, I just, when you were saying that, I was thinking of the Woodside example of the kid that was there for 500 odd days temporarily. Um, uh, just one comment. Um, yes, just I wanted the committee to know that um, when the uh, the temporary order that has not been served is continued, uh, the order would remain in effect, but we send a new notice of hearing for service on the defendant. In other words, we just don't leave the order out there without a notice of hearing. We reschedule mm -hmm. the final hearing and send a new notice with the original temporary order. So it's not as if the order is out there and the court isn't taking any action. We are continually trying to get that final hearing and get service. Uh, so it's not just left um, without any action by the court. We will issue um, uh, a new notice of, hear notice of final hearing for service upon the defendant, get that into the hands of law enforcement. So it's served with the original order. So there's no confusion over the date of the new hearing. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that's important for the committee to understand it. It's not just left um, out there. Okay. Good. Okay. Right, yes. May, may I uh, note one thing? I just wanted to note that, um, you know, I think that there is some restriction on the extension of the temporary order. And that is that the court needs to place on the record um, findings that there's good cause to extend that hearing. So in the case of, for example, um, as the defender general highlighted a reconciliation between the parties or something like that, um, you know, my in my experience, I've never um, seen the court use something like that to extend an order if, if a plaintiff does not appear. Um, clearly, you know, we do believe that these orders ought to be pursued by the plaintiff, that that is the nature of the civil process. Um, and if the plaintiff doesn't appear, then um, unless, again, there's very extraordinary circumstances, um, the order, it, the, the, the order should be dismissed. Um, John Campbell, any thoughts? If you'd like. You're still there. He's still there. Committee, um, the decision really, I, I didn't hear any issues with, um, other than uh, 
changing the wording in the um, in section one, the it, to make sure that we don't mess that up. And so the real disagreement is about B on page three, line six through eight. Any thoughts, uh, John Campbell? No, I, 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 I don't. Uh, there were a couple of things I was thinking, but it, it's really so far into the weeds. And it, uh, I, again, I think it's, it comes down to a policy decision that you guys have to make. Um, you know, Matt's made some good points as well. And, uh, but I, I think it's, we have to look at the importance and the original uh, purpose of the, of the bill and the legislation and uh, protecting, you know, the people who have sought these orders. I am concerned about temporary. And, yeah. and, and the example I gave of the kid at Woodside, and I, I can't remember the exact number of days, but he had been temporarily placed there for over 500 days um, when we met him. Um, it, it, you know, it, it was temporary, but there was no better alternative. And, it, and sometimes I think things fall through the cracks because um, so... Can you can, can you do something along the lines of uh, the temporary the period cannot extend the uh, beyond the the uh, I think you could extend beyond six months or three months without another additional hearing like that. Yeah. Temporary. The, the final order, order, I'm sorry. Without an additional hearing, so that at least at that point there's some kind of um, you don't have to say that it it ends. It just says without a an additional hearing that would to me to be I, I don't know what the rest of the committee thinks but that to me would be a kind of a compromised position that would get us where we want to be to make sure that there's some review if it's going on and on and on i, I don't know how people feel about that i, I wouldn't i wouldn't want to go certainly longer than that maybe even go shorter That, that would be my way of, of at least assuring another hearing that it doesn't go on in yeah. ad infinitum. Joe? Yeah, I think I agree with you. I was going to ask the judge a question. Um, one of the concerns that I saw in your correspondence was that this was being looked at as if the defendant was ducking service. And I don't know if this has ever happened. This is a civil proceeding. If a defendant is ducking service, can they be served via publication? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is that is so expensive uh, for someone to pursue. In other words, you'd have to have solid information that the person is still in the area where you're going to publicize. Um, and, and service by publication is extremely expensive for the plaintiff to pursue, but we've done it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's happened. Um, yeah, at least you get a final hearing scheduled that way and the temporary doesn't continue on at infinitum. At least we're, what we're trying to do here is avoid this gap. <clears throat> I think the bill does that. And I think the amendments are healthy and help the bill. Then we come to be, and what happens if it goes on and on and on? And that's why I'm, I'm suggesting some format of rewriting it so that it would require a, um, another hearing if it goes beyond a certain length of time. Senator White. So I thought I heard both uh, Judge Gerson and Sarah say that um, every time there's a if you extended it for 14 days, every time there's a, a potential extension, there has to be good cause found. So if there isn't good cause found, then do they just issue a, I mean, it seems to me that there is some um, check on it, but I, I may have misunderstood that so that if you have a 14 day extension and then you come back for 14 days and there's no good cause found for the person to not have shown up, then you issue the final order. So I don't know that if you put that that time period on it, then I somebody had talked about, uh, then they just, they're going to say, well, they have three months, so we're just not gonna serve and we're just gonna hang around for three months. And 
so I, I just wondered if I misheard that or if it's true that every time there's a 14 day extension, there has to be good cause shown. Um, and if good cause isn't shown, then there is a final, the court just issues a final order. So the, the, if the plaintiff does not appear there under the language in the bill, there would have to, we would have to have evidence of good cause as to why we should continue it. Um, if the defendant doesn't appear, if the defendant has been served and the plaintiff appears, we're gonna issue the final order if that's what the plaintiff requests. Uh, sometimes they come in and say, a defendant has been served, defendant doesn't appear and the plaintiff wants to drop the order. Because it's a civil proceeding, that's their call. Regardless of what the, the way the affidavit reads, plaintiff does not want to pursue, we will not pursue it. The, um, on the other hand, the plaintiff not appearing usually ends up in a dismissal mm -hmm. because there is no evidence of why the plaintiff hasn't appeared. It is a rare, rare case when we have information as to why a plaintiff has not appeared. Um, and I think we talked in one of the earlier meetings, it, it just can't be that someone has indicated the plaintiff is afraid to come into court because they're afraid of the defendant. That, and, and, and that's not, if a plaintiff wants an order, they have to pursue the order. And, and if they showed good cause and then you- so And we would continue it. But if we continued it- Then they're not gonna keep showing good cause. I mean- it, At some point, I would think the right. good cause for the plaintiff not appearing would end fairly soon. In right. other words, that, that usually is not, that's why it's usually only extended for a short period of time. Um, so I don't know that this is even- in Senator Baruth has. Uh, thanks. Um, Judge Grierson, did I understand your testimony correctly that you would strike the- I don't, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and on, on the other hand, I will, I will say this, Senator, in response to what uh, Senator Sears has proposed, understand that with the information the plaintiff has provided, that they, if this order expires, let's say you put a three-month time limit on it, uh, we could conduct a hearing and the plaintiff is going to have the same probably the same testimony that they provided in the temporary order. So what you would probably end up with at that point is either an extension of the existing order for good cause, or if, you, if your bill says that temporary order has to end at three months, absent a hearing, that hearing would probably be on the same evidence that was originally presented to us. And we would again issue an order. So, I, so I, I, I guess the reason I asked the question is I, I keep coming back to where we are in the process. So we're, we're just a couple of weeks away from ending and it seems like the rest of the bill makes sense to everyone. Uh, this piece that, that we've tried to add on seems uh, productive of possible complications, possible unattended consequences. So I, I suppose I lean toward getting rid of B and moving with the rest of the bill. Senator Benning. I'm actually okay with that. If I can get the judge to look at page one for a moment, the uh, 14 day requirement. Do you believe that means that if an extension is granted of the temporary order for good cause that you would have to come back within 14 days for the next hearing? I can tell you that that is certainly the practice in my experience because of that 14 day limitation. Um, having said that, I will tell you that there are have been times in my experience where the information we have uh, on that 14th day is, let's assume at the, at the first hearing, we have very little information of why the defendant hasn't been able to be served. By the time this we come back now two weeks later, 
uh, we there may be more information. The defendant may in fact have moved out of state. And so then it's a question of, of whether we're going to, uh, whether the plaintiff is going to pursue uh, the service uh, on out of state. So there may be an occasion when we extend it uh, beyond that in order to obtain service, but there's always a date of final hearing set. They are never just continued for the sake of continuing. There's always a date uh, because that's the only way this docket functions. No, I, I understand that. And I, what I'm trying to do is look at the trade-off between eliminating a drop dead date as is presented on page three with assurance that the 14 day requirement is still in place because they have to come back every two weeks. Somebody has to establish good cause. If it fails at some point in time, then the temporary order goes away. Um, but that has been my experience that we go out for two weeks. So with that, I guess I'll go along with Philip's suggestion. I think I'd like to go with Philip's suggestion as well. Okay. Me too. Well, that's four to nothing. Um, so I guess we'll go with Philip's suggestion. <laughs> I'll, I'll vote with the majority, not that it's necessary. Oh. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank while you, I've got you. everybody here, um, I don't know if, Peggy, there's an uh, email with a attachment from a letter from um, Erica Mathage, the state attorney in Bennington County about the problems with the rollout of the Odyssey system down there. And the fact that over the Labor Day weekend, none of the law enforcement agencies had any information. So if you could post that letter on our website and um, I'm, I mean, I, we've talked about it. We've sent letters. We've done what we can. Maybe it's time to put something in language to stop the roll out of this mess. Um, the law enforcement, all the law enforcement agencies were, according to the email, and people can read over the email, and maybe um, uh, Judge Gerson, you may want to look at it once it's posted well, and, 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 and just check and with Pat Gable and see what's going on. But um, to, to be taking up a domestic violence bill now, knowing that law enforcement's not able to get into the records, um, none of the law enforcement in Bennington County were. And so how would they know if there was an outstanding court order um, on this individual that maybe is coming under this new law? I, I'm concerned about it. And uh, John Campbell, um, if you would... Uh, and I know Matt Valerio has been outspoken about it. So if you could check with uh, the Bennington, Rutland, Windsor, at Bennington, Rutland, Addison, Chittenden, your folks there, if they're having similar problems, um, we may take this letter up next week. Not that I know what we can do because we, even the letter from the Judicial Rules Committee didn't stop, didn't slow it down, but. Did you, uh, and I, I had a, I got frozen there for a second. Uh, is, are you talking about the letter from, uh, from Trevor Rip Whipple? No, I'm talking about the letter from Erica Mathage this morning that I received an email with a, with a um, attachment that has a letter. I assume that you had gotten a copy of it. If not, um, Peggy said she had, I, I asked Peggy to post it on our, on our page. So it'll be there. Um, it's about the problems there's there's quite a bit about how they didn't um, now she says no we weren't trained we asked for training we didn't get it we were directed to the portal and not training that's beside the point my concern is that they weren't able law enforcement in Bennington County wasn't able to get um, court records right that I'll send Judge Gerson also the copy of the what I this uh, email that I had seen from Trevor Whipple, uh, who's in charge. It's of posted now. Court Peggy says it's posted now. So if you want to okay. add that um, from uh, uh, Trevor Whipple, Trevor's what's Trevor now? He's um, 
He actually is in charge of, let me just, if I can pull this up real quick. He's a police chief in South Burlington? He was, yes. And um, then he, um, if you just bear with me for a second, he's, he's like in charge of the, of all the different chiefs of police or had something to do with it. And he was very concerned because he had evidently had not heard about this. And, um, um, well, if you, if so both of you, and to Judge Gerson, I, mean, I don't know what we can do. Um, in, I hate interbranch feuds, but this is really um, now impacting public safety. In my mind. If Erica Mathis statements are correct. Um, this is um, this is basically, if you want, uh, this is a letter to the chiefs. Uh, thanks for a tip from Colchester. Could you people. forward that to uh, Peggy? She can post it on our uh, okay. mini page, and then people can all see it. Okay. We'll do. But I, I, I'm asking you and Matt, and then I, I don't know what we can do. We still have a budget floating around that we can attend. I think all of us, I think Matt will join in, in this is that, you know, we want this to work. We want the, the, uh, the online of the e-filing and everything else to work, but just, it just, we're, you're getting two different stories. Um, yeah. So yeah. we've, uh, kind of beat ourselves up. Well, um, we are, so is there a motion to report or to amend S H? I get off the subject here. We all agree. Yes, 962 favorably, at, or no, excuse me, to amend 962 is seen. Or do you want Eric to do a new draft and get that to us early? To, um, which would you prefer? Eric needs to do a new draft because um, he needs to define it and he's going to take B out. I can, I'm working on it right now. I could, if you guys, I certainly could get it to you in a few minutes. Not a big difference, but or we could another day, whatever We're you prefer. Hear from Matt here. Valerio's budget, and if Matt Valerio's budget takes more than forty minutes, that would give us time around quarter of um, twelve to make a final vote on this. If you can get a final one, and you and Peggy can get it posted. Yeah, that works for me. Okay. Because um, our next subject is is Matt's budget, and um, I don't think it'll take more than forty minutes. Matt, okay. The way it's been going, if it keeps shrinking, it won't take forty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought we were going to be in a okay situation here with our with our budget um, had a plan to try to address effectively a 3% reduction, um, having in mind that there were going to be available COVID relief funds that were appropriated by the legislature in the last budget go around. Um, and then my my general feelings about taking federal money, although I know every state needs it to survive, within the Defender General system, it has typically been a nightmare anytime we get involved with the feds and federal money. Um, and that has been the case uh, this time around. Um, the last, uh, I guess, quarterly budget that came through and the budget adjustment that then accounted for the uh, the COVID relief funds um, basically put about $1.2 million available to the Defender General's office to address a number of things. Um, the easy part is dealing with the uh, IT issues relative to remote um, access to the courts and uh, trying to do the job, <coughs> excuse me, remotely as much as possible. Um, and that part is uh, relatively okay, but it's a small amount of the money. The hardest 
part was to try to deal with the surge and wave of cases that has started to come and is coming in the various counties that arises out of three things. Number one is the cases that have been uh, basically put on hold um, from the beginning of March um, until present um, that had already been charged with people in jail and people out on conditions of release um, and the like. Uh, the second is the number of cases that would be coming in where um, site people who were cited and not held on uh, bail or conditions or bail or without bail. Um, those cases which have been were cited for down the road as opposed to a couple of weeks out, they were pushed six months out, eight months out, whatever, as those started coming in. And then you combine that with the regular caseload that you would expect to get during that time frame. Now, all of that, the confluence of those three types of caseload um, turn into you know, a, a wave of cases that's coming in. And so our plan, and we described this to the legislature, both in, in the various appropriations committees, was to use the COVID funds to address that caseload. Now, when we were first told about the opportunity for this money, um, I looked at it with the same skepticism that I always look at federal money is that it usually comes with so many rings and reporting requirements that uh, you end up spending more money um, administering it than you end up getting. Um, and, but I couldn't ima have imagined that that would be the case with $1.2 million. Um, nevertheless, it seems that we are back in a similar situation that we always are when we deal with federal money. Um, the original direction from joint fiscal and the direction that we got from the, um, the bill or the whatever it was that created the CRF funding um, was that the money had to be spent before the 30th of December of 2020. Um, and we had run this by whoever we could talk to. And we, so we put into place contracts that would basically be, we would spend the money uh, before that time frame, and the deliverables would take place um, through the end of the fiscal year. So those cases, as they started coming in, were basically being front loaded. So you'd get paid front loaded, and then the cases would be um, worked out till the end of the year, uh, end of the fiscal year, ending at the before the beginning of July next year. So in doing that, we put a number of uh, contracts in place, um, approximately uh, $750,000 worth of contracts. And then just uh, probably two weeks ago, um, we get uh, contacted by a consultant who's been hired by administration to assist in the administration of these CRF funds. Um, and basically we were told that uh, the way we were doing it wasn't right. And the, that the, in fact, the deliverable had to end by uh, December 30th um, as though you were like, you know, making cheeseburgers. So you get all the, your raw materials for the cheeseburgers and you have to have $1.2 million worth of cheeseburgers completed by December 30th and eaten. Um, and, uh, you know, the way cases work, it's not like you get them in and they end. Um, you know, if I anticipated, I did a aging on these case, the, case, the way we're going to do these cases. So what we're, the plan was is to take cases that were already existing in the public defense offices um, and assign them out to contractors who, so it wasn't the brand, brand new ones, but they were ones that didn't have a lot of work done on them. And most of the cases would end up being resolved, but I figured that there'd probably be 15, 10 to 15% of them would be given back to the staff office 
as of um, July 1st of uh, 2021. Uh, but what they would do is free up the staff offices to take on the new cases that were coming in um, and address the cases that were uh, the, the ones that were coming in on citation and the new cases and then the serious cases where people were being held without bail um, or on high bail uh, that were in, uh, in the facilities. The direction was that basically half of those con 50% of the contracts amount um, was does not comply with the CRF guidelines that were issued only within the last month or so by the Department of Treasury. Um, and uh, this the, the consultants that administration are using, I guess, are commonly hired by states to keep up on the daily direction that comes from the Department of the Treasury on the administration of um, various types of federal grant money and federal funding. Um, I'd never encountered this before, and I don't know that anybody else around has has either, but effectively they said our plan wouldn't work um, for any deliverable that was going to occur after the 30th of December. So I immediately uh, terminated all of the contracts um, effective September 1st that we had put in place. Um, and we had a meeting with the people, with our contractors to let them understand what was going on because what we were doing is paying them um, one payment every, uh, they were six months of payments that would cover an entire year. Um, and so we were already three months in and that basically covered the amount that they would have been covered through the end of the year. Now there were a couple of um, contracts, uh, one in the Northeast Kingdom and the other in uh, Windsor County, which were with um, primary public defense uh, contract uh, contractors, not additional. They had already the all the other ones were new, new contractors, new contracts that we brought in to do this work on the criminal side. Those two, um, because of two things, um, number one, this influx of caseload that was clearly COVID related. And number two, um, the fact that they were using, um, that the court has been put in an odd position and it's really wreaked havoc with our uh, service provision. Part of it's, a, I'm sure is a communication issue and then I don't even know what the rest of the part of it is, but the bottom line is that the use of regional arraignments now has dumped significantly more work on the counties that do regional arraignments. Um, the big, biggest problems right now are in Windsor County um, and also, we have issues in, in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. Um, the, there's a whole other issue going on with uh, Chittenden County, Franklin County, and then the northern part of the state and how that gets divided up. But for purposes of this CRF funding, um, we were able to um, attribute a certain amount of money to both the Northeast Kingdom primary public defense contractor and the Windsor primary public defense contractor because of the increase in work that they had doing regional arraignments in, in, in the South. What that basically means is that Windsor had been doing arraignments and has been for a period of months during this COVID term, you know, since March um, and shortly thereafter for Rutland, Bennington, and Wyndham counties, um, they had to hire another person to deal with that. Northeast Kingdom law um, also had similar situation. The, in concept, the, the consultant said to us, well, that seems to be legitimate um, that you can attribute an amount of funds to those two 
things that you are trying to do and that you are doing. But again, no deliverables after December 30th, but, it, but we have uh, the ability to amend those contracts to use some of that CRF funding to cover that, cover that work. Uh, the other, all the other ones are, I've terminated and we are, we are, uh, that is part of where this uh, um, $400,000 hole has come up with. And that's about 300,000 of the $400,000 hole is covering those contracts if we want to do that, or if, if you want to do that. Um, if those are not covered, basically what will end up happening is just the system will, I can't imagine it grinding to a slower halt than it already is right now. <laughs> um, but uh, that's what that's what's going to happen. It's just you're just going to have a massive backlog of cases all over the state. Um, and they're going to be handled by the existing uh, existing contractors uh, who are in place. Um, and uh, there'll be likely some backlash as we approach next year's contract time when everybody's going to be looking for more money because they got, you know, a third to 50% more cases than they did uh, previously, um, basically as pending cases because they can't be moved. Um, the, uh, the other part of this, and I don't, sometimes I don't understand, I think, the, the long-term thinking or not long-term thinking. I, I think of things in sometimes two or three year increments. And we got notice about uh, six to 10 months ago uh, that our case management provider would no longer be supporting the case management system that we have in place and that we need to put a new one in by July 1st of uh, next year, which is a very similar situation to what uh, um, the state's attorneys have run into because they use the same uh, provider. Um, we, in preparing for that, um, this, the company we've been dealing with, JTI, same as the state's attorneys, um, have, some, have a system called uh, eDefender that has a known cost that we ought to be able to tra transfer into if, you know, after we go through the RFP process. Um, but we've been carrying forward IT money in anticipation of being able to pay for that when it came due without asking for additional money. Um, and that has always been left alone that that case management money and lo and behold this year after the first budget came out administration snatched a hundred thousand dollars of the carry forward um and at the same time this uh, here it's a bit, little bit of a convoluted story but i have a little bit of time to explain it every year we have a maintenance fee of about a hundred thousand dollars that gets paid to jti as part of the uh, uh, case management system. Uh, last year, Agency of Digital Services, we had to do an amendment of the security agreement that is part of the, uh, part of the whole uh, maintenance, security and maintenance agreement. When they sent, when JTI sent the bill, that agreement hadn't been um, approved by ADS and it went through a whole bunch of different hands and we still haven't paid last year's $100,000 that uh, was going toward, that was gonna go toward uh, uh, this maintenance agreement because ADS never approved the security agreement. It went through four people's hands. Apparently now they're very close to um, a approving it and getting it all ready so we could pay last year's bill. But what it has done is carried, we were carrying forward the money into this year from last year to pay last year's bill. 
and that money was taken by administration at the same time they're approving the bill that doubled the amount we have to pay. So the bill went to 200,000 and they took a hundred of it away that we had had set aside to pay for it. So the bottom line is that's how you add up to $400,000, which is, which is basically, I sent you a, a, an email regarding that Senator Sears yep. and yes, the anticipation that you would bring this to whoever needed it to be brought to. Well, I um, did, did the house put anything in? As I understand it today, um, they went with the governor's recommend of uh, the 3% reduction. So there was nothing additional. No, um, you didn't get any of the 400,000. No. Um, the, uh, um, at some point, this, this IT issue is going to have to get resolved. And the way I deal with any of these things is, you know, I figure the legislature makes a policy decision about what, how much money they want to give and what they want to get done. And so I try to live within it. And in doing that, it really what ends up happening is I don't do some things so I can do the things that are core uh, to the system. And I've been able to make it work. And I can probably, quote unquote, make this work, but it's not going to be without uh, pain um, and significant pain. And, you know, I don't want the courts breathing down my neck about, oh, you don't have enough people doing this work and, you know, clients complaining and that kind of thing, because this is what we signed up for if this is the way we're going to do it. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, in the meantime, um, along the way, we've also had, we have positions we can't fill that have been, uh, somebody left and worst time ever for an agency like ours to leave. So you have, uh, we have a juvenile division that had one support staff for um, two lawyers, an investigator, and then to coordinate the, the state reviews of, uh, on, uh, in Chin's cases, the administrative reviews, that person happened to leave in the middle of this COVID thing. We can't fill the position. And uh, it sounds like, well, it's one administrative person. Well, the problem is it's the only administrative person. So I've got, you probably know Mary Diat, who has been over in the legislature. She is our HR person, our stats person, and she manages the, the case management system. She's also now attempting to do the job of the, <laughs> that admin person. Um, so we, we, we're very close to the bone at all times. So when we lose you know, one, it's, you know, it's not like when, when uh, AHS loses one admin person and right. they've got, you know, hundreds of others who could fill in. We're, you know, we're now I'm using upper management people to, to fill in for um, admin stuff. So the bottom just, line, so, it's so important. Go ahead, I'm sorry. It, it, that's all I'm saying is it's important money and the ripple effects throughout the system of things that look small on the outside. Like if I were in a, if I were in administration and I was looking at, oh, look, they have $100,000 out of 375 coming forward that we're just going to, we can take out of their IT. It doesn't look like a lot, but they don't understand the details or the nuance of what goes on with that and how close we are to the bone. And nobody ever, nobody ever really has um, since I've been doing this job, but we, you know, because I've always tried to make it work and not complain very much. Just so I, I, just so I have it correct. Um, we would be recommending to the appropriations committee that they fund 300,000 in new money um, to uh, make all the contracts that will be needed between now and the end of this fiscal year and, uh, and 100,000 for you to be able to pay your IT uh, contract. Um, yeah, and be able to replace the system which was taken out of carry forward funds is correct is that correct so i just want to, because they that's spending and they're double spending that right in a way because they're saying you you're carry forward a hundred thousand 
we're going to take that and buy birdhouses with it. And now you got to come up with a hundred thousand to pay your contract. Am I correct? Yeah. And the, the thing that's annoying about it is that it was ADS's delay in approving the security agreement that prevented us from spending the money last year when we had the money and we wouldn't have carried it forward to begin with. So, so that, you know, they kind of created the carry forward, took the money and then left us with twice the bill. Okay. And I, and I know that it, uh, the finance side has no idea what went on with ADS. Yeah. I, I I'm going to, uh, and the, the third thing I want to mention of the 300,000 I have no idea. The whole state is just waiting for Congress to do something, whether it's pull their hair out and say, we're not going to help you at all, whether it's to rework the CARES Act funds that we've already received and say, yes, you can use them until July 1, 2021, um, which would allow you to fulfill the contracts. Or, I mean, this is... Um, been true at Senator Nick and those too, as, as we've sat in appropriations and heard the concerns of what we thought we could spend them. Somebody says, no, you can't. Or they say, yes, you can now spend that because other states spent it and they didn't get clawed back. So it's, yeah. it's been a really um, strange system. Um, and, you know, then there's the other thought that perhaps Congress would write another check um, the, for, for particular help to the states. But because we're going to be gone before Congress presumably does anything. Yeah, one, one of the things that at this right now. Is they, they could even foresee that the direction from the Treasury Department would, to, would allow the expenditure of the money after January 1st. Right. There could be a change in that policy, um, even even without congressional action. Um, but they were hoping, they thought for sure that they were gonna get something before Labor Day, which didn't happen. Right, so, which was know. the reason we scheduled to meet our session the way we did. I don't know, of course, the other reality was we have to have a budget by October 1st. So um, committee, are there any comments, questions, or do you wanna just recommend Senator White was first, Senator Benning was second, Senator, anybody else who wants to comment is third. I was just going to say that the federal government is so screwed up and the treasury is so screwed up that this is the day today that I'm supposed to give my social security check. Then hasn't come. They're, I don't know if they're not sending them out or if they ran out of money or what. But or the mail. Or the mail. No. It's direct oh. deposit. Oh, it's direct deposit. Yep. I, I do have one. Well, question. I'm the fourth Wednesday of the month, so I hope they straighten it out by then. <laughs> one, one question for uh, Matt. Uh, so, Alice, Alice, uh, Joe is. Oh, next sorry. And then you. Yep. Joe. You're muted, Joe. Yeah, my space bar temporary unmute wasn't working. Um, Matt, I've got a question and then a comment. My question is, I've been dragging my heels on buying a new computer system because we're the last on the list for this rollout. And uh, you had said previously that there was $2,000 available for right. each of us to uh, get new computer system and be reimbursed right. with. Is that still available? Yeah. Okay. Buy it, buy it, and send the bill. I mean, do buy it, it now. Don't, yeah. don't right. buy it. Do not. That's one part that is very easy and is not in dispute. But don't screw around with it. Buy it immediately, and okay. buy the buy the best you can get, especially the space bar. But I only get two thousand back max. No, not necessarily. That was our estimate um, based upon the number of contractors and. We've had some who haven't needed anything at all. And so there have been others that needed more and we were able to give them more. Okay. Um, the comment is with respect to Mary Diet, when I filed my statistics this past month, I had more cases on that month's statistics than I've ever had before. 
It was at least four times the previous month. Yep. And I responded to her with a comment when I sent those statistics saying, maybe it's time for me to retire. And just so you know, she immediately shot back something that said, if you're out of here, I'm out of here. So just be watching your, your staff. You may end up uh, with another retirement in the not too distant future. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the, that is the thing that uh, it's worrisome is that you, when you also, you got people who really like their job and they get fried uh, by doing too much because we aren't giving them the support they need and they just say, we're out of here. Um, you know, um, that is, uh, it's a real concern. Well, and then of nice course, door. I'm, I'm doing the best I can, but you know, you can only be so nice to Mary. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, 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 I don't want to continue the Mary talk, um, or Joe's <laughs> retirement. Um, you know, you, I think the system in the, particularly in the kingdom could not afford to lose another good lawyer. So, That's for sure. Uh, with that endorsement, I'll go to Alice next. So uh, just a question with regard to, you know, you're, you're asking for the 300,000, but the fact is you've already, as you needed to do, um, dro drop those contracts that would have spent that 300,000. So now you don't know if they're available again or not. Is that the case or what's going on there? Well, the, I had a meeting with all of them and they're all paid through the end of December. Mm -hmm. um, so if, <clears throat> if the funding became available, I would, uh, we would amend the contract or put new contracts in place that would start January 1st and go through the end of the fiscal year covering the same caseload. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Why don't we, Peggy, if we could take a, I believe it's 11.35. We said we'd get back at 12, at 11.45. So can we yep. take a 10 minute break? Yep. And then back at 11, or actually nine minute, eight minute break. And yep. then come back to S690, whatever that number is. Yes, it's posted. Thank okay. you. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back from our break. <clears throat> we have draft 4.1. I guess I got to update my thing here because I don't have that 4.1. I don't either. Yeah, I had to turn. I had to actually log out. Not log out, but I... I turned off my internet and logged back in. Oh, I probably need to go back to the committee webpage then. Right. All right. I'm at the webpage. No, nope, I'm not. Uh, yeah, if you go out and come back, it's there. Speaking of, yeah. Okay, no, I just pushed the wrong button. Wednesday, September 9th. It is Wednesday. It is draft 4.1 is there. And Campbell has a letter too from Trevor. It's now posted. So I don't see yellow anywhere. So that means this is the final copy, right? That's right, Senator Sears. So it does, does it do everything we wanted you to, to do it to do? Every every order under on section one and page one, every order issued under this section shall inform the defendant if she fails to appear at the final hearing, then the temporary order remain in effect till the final law is served, then the defendant unless the temporary order is dismissed by the court. That's much better. The next part the order is issued shall remain in effect until either dismissed by the court or the defendant fails to appear at the final hearing, petition shall be dismissed, provided the court may continue temporary order until final hearing. If it makes findings on the record state why there is good cause shown if the final order is issued, temporary orders remain in effect until purpose personal service of the final order. Act takes effect on passage. Any further to, any questions about it or comments from either Matt Valerio, John Campbell, Brian Gerson, or Sarah Robinson? Our committee member. Looks good to the defender. 
We've lost Senator Campbell, John Campbell, but that's okay. Sarah, you okay with it? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, good. And so, Judge? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. Thank the committee. Thank you. All right, so is there a motion to report draft 4.1 or to amend H962 as uh, seen in draft 4.1? So moved. Senator Baruth has moved that we report favorably, or excuse me, that we amend H962 as seen in draft 4.1. Second. Further, seconded and further discussion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That was um, a late aye. <laughs> that was a late aye, but we're, you know, I, I've noticed that on the floor too. Sometimes I get in there late and forget to unmute, and then I'm an eye when he's <laughs> asking for the nose. Um, okay, um, we have approved the changes. Uh, shall we report the bill favorably to the full Senate? Uh, Senator Baruth, Senator White has moved that we report the bill H. 962 favorably to the full Senate. Is there any further discussion? As amended. As amended. Peggy, would you please call the roll? Yep. Senator White? Yes. Senator Baruth? Yes. Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Who would like to report this bill? Feels like a Benning to me. Well, I thought the rule was that if you move to amend first, you're the one who gets to report on it. That's why I didn't move to amend. <laughs> sure, uh, I'll hail it. What the heck? Would you, uh, if you'd like to, Joe, that would be helpful. Actually, so um, I, I believe this has been approved by the rules committee, so I don't think it needs to go through rules. That is correct, as I recall it. Yeah, Eric, so if it you be just, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Eric, if you just give me a couple of sentences to uh, give a overall summary, that would be Yeah, I've got actually, I've been work. I've got a, maybe longer than you want. I've got a couple of pages, but you know, it sort well, of summarizes. I, I can edit pretty well. So. Yeah, that's what I figured. Just discard whatever you don't want to use. <laughs> okay. And Peggy, <laughs> could you get me a list of the witnesses, please? Yep, and so that means it'll be Senator Benning that gets this the vote and the version to Bloomer, correct? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So get it to me, Eric, and I'll get it to him. Okay. Thanks. Thank Committee, um, my plan is to send a email to um, Chair Kitchell with copies to the Senator Propes, Stephanie Barrett, and <clears throat> this committee um, expressing our concern about the $300,000 in contracts for the Defender General that should be added to the budget for 2021, fiscal year 2021. And also regarding the $100,000 carry forward, which was taken inadvertently, which leaves them with a $100,000 bill for their IT. Is that the sense of the committee? Yes. yes. All right, we'll see you all tomorrow as we continue our um, efforts to find out what the house is doing.